Welcome to Holistic Wisdom Awakening, your inner healer. I'm Elena, and I have a really special guest today. I'm happy he said yes to me for an interview. Uh, Dr. Nathan Goodyear, I'll do a brief introduction. We actually met, I can't even remember, probably 10 years ago. Uh, so Dr. Goodyear's passion for wellness began with his own 100-pound post-college football career weight loss. We can talk about that. Uh, he is a medical director of Brio Medical, a holistic holistic integrative cancer healing center in Arizona, where he uses the principle and science of holistic, natural, and integrative therapies to treat and heal people with cancer. Additionally, Dr. Goodyear is a chairman of the Scientific Medical Advisory Board of the Vitamin C International Consortium Institute and president of U.S. International Society of Medical Laser Applications. I'm interested to hear about that too. He's a published author author of two books, Man Boob Nation, an integrative medicine approach to low testosterone published in 2014, and a total testosterone transformation published in 2017. He also speaks across the country on various topics in the area of integrative cancer and wellness medicine. Thank you. And welcome, Nathan, for, I hope it's okay I call you Nathan. I could also call you Dr. Goodyear. Nathan is more of how I remember calling you. It's a pleasure. And as we were talking before the recording, how um, I can remember you and I sitting down, it was actually at an A4M event. Uh, I think it was in Tampa. And yeah. we were we were talking and we had met, uh, you know, briefly before. But uh, it's interesting how our cross path again, our, yeah, our paths cross again. And, and so, um, always a pleasure to talk to colleagues. Oh, thank you so much. Colleagues and friends, really. Yes, yes. And I would love to first go on a journey with you, people who don't know that, you know, the hundred pound weight loss that you've had because you were a, a college football player, right? So let's, let's probably, let's start there. I think it's an important journey of where you've been and what brought you to where you are today and the amazing work that you're offering in your clinic in Arizona. Yeah, because life really is a journey, is it not? And, and you don't really know where you are unless you know that story. And each patient has that. And every one of us has that. So when I, when I played football, I played center and uh, a lot of people look at that and they're like, oh, quarterback, wide receiver. I was like, no, I'm too short and too slow. So, but center, um, I played at about 285, um, 290. So I was, I was a big, hefty guy, um, size, I think it was 24 neck. So I, I was a huge guy. Um, and within five years and then within 10, there were two of my uh, friends that I played with that had died from massive cardiovascular events. And I knew that as I was making my move that within that five years into a medical wellness area, I had to look the part and I had a budding family and I needed to be around to support them as well. And so I, I set out to, you know, change the way I lived <clears throat> and to lose that weight. Now I lost too much weight, got down to 172, too much weight. So I think I've found a little bit of a happy medium, but that was really what steered me to make that move was to, if I was going to talk to patients that came into my office to, you know, take control of their life and be well. And then I didn't look at, I had no credibility. I had no cred. And so I had to live the part to be able to teach the part. Mm. That is a key, you know, oftentimes patients seek out help, whether it's from physicians or health coaches, whoever it might be, you know, and it's important that when you're seeking for that advice, that you're looking to, to get that advice from somebody who is living what they're teaching. And you're such a great example of that. And then you went on a journey, you graduated from medical school and you became an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's really what <clears throat> began this integrative transformation. We always have people that are put in our past. At that point, when I was in medical school, was a, a dear, dear friend of mine, uh, in a compounding pharmacist, who kept talking to me about bioidentical hormones. And I kept going, oh, show me the science, Joe, show me the science. And so he kept showing me the science and I kept ignoring it. And <clears throat> then when I got into the actual practice of medicine, I started to discover that what we were taught actually didn't necessarily bear out results in our patients because we never saw the results of our therapies as a, as a resident. We would go through rotations and so we'd institute treatments and we never saw the results of that. 
And then the whole just mess of the vaginal mesh and everything there. And it was like, this, you know, this transition into bioidentical hormones and then into wellness really was brought forth by events and relationships. And that only continued even to where I am today. Hmm, that's wonderful. And then an event that occurred to you, with you, something that you've experienced as a massive change, perhaps you want to talk about 2015. So this was way after I, you know, I met you before that. And only when I looked up, because we haven't seen each other or talked in a while, I realized, wow, you, you were diagnosed with cancer. And that has been an instrumental <clears throat> shift into what you do today which has been a divine intervention in many ways, right? So let's talk yeah. about that too. No doubt, I have a dear friend. She says, all of us have a bold mission in life. She's got a book coming out in February and it's believe it, own it, live it and deliver it. She says duplicate, I say deliver it. But, um, and so th this is my bold mission. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with a rare tumor called a pheochromocytoma, which is one of those things that when you're in medical school or any type of medical training, they said, oh, here, it's a test question, but you, you'll never see it. Well, not only did I see it, but I lived it. And, you know, so blood pressure is 300 over 130. Um, so and it, it was one of those things that until a doctor or any type of medical prov provider has the unfortunate opportunity of actually sitting in the seat and the shoes of what it means to be a patient, where when you have this word called cancer or tumor over you, you have no idea what those thoughts, those emotions, what, what, what goes through you. But when you're sitting there, it changes all of perspective, everything. And so at that point, I knew that my career was never going to be the same. In fact, when we were driving out here or flying out here to Arizona, I was talking to my wife. I said, you know, this, there's no going back. There's no going back. And, and the great, great, great wife that she is, she said, why would we ever want to go back? And I was like, all right, let's charge into it. So, um, but yeah. So it opened you up to a holistic approach, which is so interesting because we're in a holistic uh, podcast interview. And take me on a journey of why the dots connected for you. First of all, the recognition that you're not just a physical being, because that's part of the holistic approach right that we're not just these mechanical beings there's something greater a greater force that guides what happens in our life and how we're able to perceive the totality of who we are which is so much greater than just this this physical body but without treating and respecting the body right everything else will fall apart so perhaps you can share how the dots uh, began to connect for you of why it became a holistic clinic for you and a holistic approach. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a nerd. I like to write. I like to read research. And so as I write, I research what I'm writing about to, to write. And I became very interested in words and, and what they mean, because I noticed that what I thought words mean, actually from a historical context, it meant nothing of what that word originally meant. And so words are really just history reaching out to modern times and providing a, a impact. And so I started looking at what does it mean to be a physician? Because I saw the opportunity, this transition to uh, cancer treatment from an integrated perspective. So at that point, it was all integrative. I thought, well, I want to look back at what does it mean to be a physician? What does it mean to be a doctor? Because that needs to be what, what I do. And lo and behold, the word physician in Hebrew, rofe, means healer. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. And it's like, holy cow. How many doctors, <clears throat> if you're at a conference and you say, okay, how many healers are here? Okay, there are going to be no doctors that raise their hand. Now, I gladly will, and you probably would as well, but that's what we are. It's not prescriber of medication or diagnosing of disease. It is healer. And then the word doctor in Latin, dossier, means teacher. Interestingly enough, the word integration comes from the Latin word integration mem, which means restore the whole. So when you bring these together, it's like, holy cow, I'm a healer that teaches how patients need to restore their whole. And so for me, that constant contextualization of what it means of what I do 
forces me as I read the science. And honestly, I think the science forces us to be more holistic because that's really what the, the research shows. I, I think it's really easy. I think it's the harder path, I think, is denying that and saying, no, I'm just going to keep this compartmentalized. I'm going to I'm going to compete, uh, complete and continue a reductionism approach, which is contrary to holism. And just, I'm just going to look at this as, no, you're not a person. You're not a mother. You're not a sister. You're not a brother. You're cancer. And I think that is completely devoid of what it means at a core historically and even presently to be a physician. Mm. That's beautiful. And I hope more, more physicians awaken to what they're here to do which is well, it's not a awakening problem. to remember it's, it's remembering. remembering that's it awakening to remember <laughs> yeah it's remembering yeah. we've just forgotten mm. just yes. forgotten so take take us on a journey of what kind of patients come to you and let's say you have a patient that is diagnosed do you work with every kind of cancer is there is there a different approach to different cancers and what, uh, what do you offer as um, treatment options or guide us on a journey of what a patient would be expecting if they were to reach into, into your clinic? Yeah, so we're here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, we have patients that really come from all over the country, all over the world, uh, pre-COVID more so than, than now, but still, I mean, we have a patient here from Canada. Um, and so... We see patients of all cancer types. Most of our patients, I probably say over 90% are um, advanced. And I like to use that word other than, rather than stage four because that just evokes fear and we wanna evoke hope. Um, so we, we see all varieties. I've seen men with breast cancer, you know, very, very rare forms of, of, of cancer types. You know, we got a gentleman here right now that was diagnosed with an osteosarcoma when he's 12 and he's been battling it for 10 years, undergone so many surgeries. Uh, so we see recurrent advanced cancer, all varieties. They've e they're they either coming without having had any type of conventional treatment or having so many conventional treatments that their body is reeling from that. And so what we do is we set forth and I tell them, look, our job, it, it's to heal you. You know, I love the title of your podcast and I'm not surprised that came from you. Because that word holistic, W-H, it actually in old English means healthy. And, and the root word of that word healthy is heal. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what we set out to do. And I tell patients, look, we want to take natural, holistic, and integrative therapies to heal you, to make you whole. That's what it means to be integrative. So what we do is, you know, the patients come in, of course, <clears throat> we have to do that, you know, typical doctor stuff and take histories and that kind of stuff. And, you know, we need to know what we're dealing with. So, you know, imagery and labs, all of these things. So we'll take pieces of things from conventional therapy. I tell patients, look, you break a hip. I'm not going to tell you, go take more vitamin D. You got to surgically repair that. Now let's work to help that heal better and not happen again. So there are aspects of what conventional medicine can bring us that at the time we may not want, but we need. And so in that aspect of that, you know, that's that analogy of a broken hip, ah, I got to, you know, got to fix that. So we, we look and see, what do we see? Do we see tumors that have spread? Do we see tumors that are confined? What do labs show us? How's liver function, kidney function, the inflammatory response? And then from that, we set forth on a customized, personalized, precision and accuracy based program. You know, there's a lot of people that will go and they're they're given a plan of care and they've not been examined. There's been no evaluation. It's like that's 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 uh, that, that's like fast food medicine. It's like fast food holistic. It doesn't work. And so from that standpoint, we develop a precise and accurate treatment program based on you know really the metabolomics, the genomics, the proteomics, and um, which is the future of medicine, but actually using it in a holistic, natural, integrative way to be precise and accurate in what's contributing to the cancer, the dysfunction that's a part of that, and then how to heal that. So these therapies, of course, begin with nutrition. Uh, they Everybody focuses on the IVs, but there's many different uh, supplements, maybe a repurposed medication here or two that can be combined with a holistic therapy. Then with the IV therapies, which is what, again, most people will focus on, 
course, the IV vitamin C in high dose following the science, curcumin, quercetin, resveratrol, artesanate, DCA. Uh, we'll even do a, a, a really kind of low dose targeted form of chemo called IPT. And then we couple these, can't forget mistletoe, uh, mistletoe IV and peptides, which are great. And that's, I think that's really exciting stuff is peptides, which will do IV and sub-Q. And then couple that and sequence that with things like the photodynamic therapy, hyperthermia, uh, and bringing these all together because cancer didn't occur because of one thing, nor will it be healed by one thing. It is understanding the complexity of it and then going after it as such with a sequence and complexity of treatment strategies. So that is a broad-based stroke kind of approach of, of of an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as far as changing the diet, I think that's key, right? Is balancing the gut. And you say that that's the first approach. Do you also offer any kind of, or in your clinic, emotional oh, yeah. support, emotional, right? Releases. And then as far as uh, vitamin C, because that's been around forever, as far as I remember, right? But what are, for example, some of the dosages that you go with? Is it above close to 100 grams of vitamin C IV, or do you tend to stay more on the lower end? Do you see any kind of difference with, or does it depend on the cancer? Yeah. And I, and I, I glossed over it. So I want to go back to it. So thank you bringing attention to, uh, you know, on the nutrition and the, the spiritual healing component of it, you know, in many ways, we had a new patient come in yesterday who said, look, I think my cancer was caused by a toxic family environment. Mm -hmm. He said, is that possible? I said, oh, absolutely it is. And so we, and, and very, patients will coming in varying levels of stress and trauma in their life. But when you look at cancer, there's some degree of component of that. And the body, the physical body is merely the manifestation of that underlying. And the spiritual, emotional, psychological are really in a lot of ways manifested out in the physical I tell patients, if you believe you can heal, that body will follow. If you don't, it doesn't matter what therapy is given to it. So that is foundational nutrition is you can't heal from cancer without proper nutrition. It's just, it's not possible. Um, so thank you for that uh, redirection. But from a vitamin C perspective, again, it's diving back into the science because the science is there. You know, it's, it's maligned by calling it a vitamin which goes back into a early, a late 19th century uh, uh, chemist who discovered these, had these things called amines and they were vital to life. That's what they thought at the time. But really vitamin C is really littered through the literature, the science about how its anti-cancer effect occurs. It's actually affecting the metabolism in, a can in the cancer but it does so and doesn't affect healthy cells, what I call kind of a dualistic perspective. And the science says, look, not only do we have to achieve a plasma vitamin C level of a certain level, Dr. Riordan described this back in the 90s, so he did great research there. And it said, look, we need to be at 350 to 450 nanograms per deciliter. But the question is, does that plasma vitamin C level, that blood vitamin C level, does it reach the tumor and tumors? Does it penetrate the tumor? Does it spread and saturate the tumor? I mean, that's these are areas and questions that science is beginning to understand. And so we can't just give a vitamin C, you know, <clears throat> I tell patients, you know, you'll be sitting a six foot six, 350 pound, will be sitting next to a patient that's five foot two and 110 pounds. Intuitively, they know our dosing needs to be different. And so the dosing has to be guided by weight as the science describes, and then adjusted and amended as the vitamin C levels come back. And so we, that's how we do it. There's a lot of variables that affect vitamin C levels. So obviously weight, tumor burden, inflammation, uh, detoxification, these affect vitamin C levels. And so we just have to dose it appropriately. We'll have patients that have 75 grams, you know, three days a week. And then we'll have patients that are getting, you know, 150 grams, three days a week. So, so it, blood tests it, it, that you do to check to check before yeah. and after to see the saturation. Yeah, we do a plasma ascorbic acid level, and that's the best tool we have because you know cancer has this angiogenesis neogenesis process where it takes all of this torturous blood supply to support its rapid growth, 
and that that creates hypoxia in and around the tumor and tumor microenvironment. And what that does is that actually really limits also the delivery of ox, uh, vitamin C. So it's recognizing how to use vitamin C, but the science has how to use it. And what happens is in, in, in medicine is we get a little bit um, lazy and we want to just, you know, do a protocol. And, and unfortunately, when you're treating cancer, you can't do that. And we have to treat p- patients precisely, accurately, and individually. Mm-hmm. And what happens with patients who have a genetic SNP, let's say, of G6PD? Like well, those are the patients, in most cases, they say have sensitivity uh, to to high doses of vitamin C. Do you see that? And then how do you approach people who have that issue? Yeah, interestingly, I've been doing vitamin C since 2010, so over 12 years, high dose, and I've only seen two patients that have had uh, G6-glucose-6 phosphate dehydrogenase. Since I've been treating cancer exclusively over the last five years, I've not seen one. And and we have patients from all over the world, even from Africa. So I've not seen one. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but it's really interesting because the focus on G6-PD or glucose-6 phosphate dehydrogenase is, well, if if you have a deficiency, so if it's low, you can't get vitamin C. Interestingly enough, described in the science is how G6PD, an enzyme, is intimate in the metabolism of cancer. So not only is it something beyond can you give vitamin C safely, but it's a metabolic tumor marker we can follow. So we actually follow it with all of our patients in cancer every two to three weeks, because if we're seeing G6PD come down, metabolically, we know we're having an impact on that Warburg effect and that <clears throat> metabolic derangement that cancer has. But in in 12 years, I've only had two patients uh, that have uh, had limitations on their vitamin C because of that G6PD2. The bigger issue I have is people that are smokers and having to limit vitamin C dosing because of that. But usually when they come with cancer, I tell them, look, you know, those days are done. And, and so um, it, it's, it's not a big issue. You need to be aware of it. I know there are people that advocate not checking G6PD because it's so rare. And that's true. That's been my experience. But I think it's still something we need to, we need to check a negative box. Mm, I'd actually just thought of somebody I know who just had breast cancer and she has G6PD. So I wonder... Uh- I wonder if uh, now, now you're making me think that it's perhaps showing as positive because there's still some kind of markers present in her system. Yeah, there, there's a lot of labs that are in just conventional labs. You don't have to jump into specialty testing of a dear friend that has a um, a lab that does hormones and hormone metabolites, Sava. And, um, you know, there's conventional labs that there's so much information there that just gets overlooked. Mm-hmm. And so you can see so much um, there and, and, you know, that's G6PD is a perfect example. Yes. And as far as uh, heat, using heat uh, to kill cancer, what kind of temperatures do you recommend for people to, uh, to sit in? Do you also use cold therapy? Yeah, we, we, we will. I mean, hyperthermia is one of those things. You know, it's kind of one of those things. You can have so many tools in the tool shed and it's like, well, which one do I use? And so for me, it's always about looking at the volume of evidence, how strong it is, and which one um, can we integrate with other therapies. So it's not enough to find a therapy that's in the science, but it's one that shows, hey, when you couple it with this, you couple it with that, that you really provide that 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 benefit that you're looking for. But with hyperthermia, I think the, the, the question has to be asked, what form of hyperthermia are we talking about here? Heating up. Um, Heat is really something our body produces when it's trying to protect itself. Temperature, we get a fever. That is the body's inerrant capacity to heal. And so what hyperthermia really is, is born out of the late 19th century. It is a recognition of trying to stimulate that, but do so in a controlled manner. And it's what form of hyperthermia are we talking about? Well, when the literature talks about hyperthermia, it's talking about core temperature. So you cannot measure this with anything other than core temperature evaluation. And the target there is 39 to 41 degrees Celsius. And so we're talking about 102.8 up to 106. 
And so people go, holy cow, how long do I need to be there? Oh, about two hours. So it, it is a process. It takes six to seven hours um, heating up. You have to sedate patients. We don't want to knock them out. And we use natural holistic therapies to do that as well. We, I'm a big fan of medical cannabis. And uh, we use that in a wide variety of ways. Actually doing a webinar tonight about that. Um, you know, the science on medical cannabis is crazy strong, just like hyperthermia. It's just recognizing it and, and using it. And so we'll heat patients up to, you know, 102.8 to 106. And uh, that core temperature through proper sedation not only directly kills cancer cells, but it signals and gets the immune system involved in doing the same. Then when you couple it with other therapies like vitamin C and curcumin research shows that you're augmenting that effect, you're augmenting vitamin C levels. And so it's really improving the delivery of vitamin C into the tumor and the tumor microenvironment and the immune system because the heat will improve the blood flow to the tumor. So it, it really is a therapy that I tell patients if I was ever, you know, if I have ever got uh, shipwrecked on an island and I could take three three, uh, you know, holistic cancer therapies, what would I take? And I know that's a weird thing, but um, I would say hyperthermia is one of those because it is instrumental and foundational to everything. And so that, that's, that therapy is, is. How great. many, yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't realize it was for that many hours. Wow. Six, seven hours. How many times a week do you normally recommend for people to do this in your clinic? Oh, that just once a week. Oh, just uh, because, yeah, you can't handle it more than that. If you do it properly, again, patients that go, well, I have hyperthermia. And I said, well, I actually had a patient. I had hyperthermia. I said, really? I said, yeah, I got in a tent. I said, tent, your head in it, right? Yes. No, mm -mm, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, so hyperthermia um, here, the it's, um, you know, it is a procedure with great benefit, but it's timing and what it does for the body, and then how the body needs to recover once a week. Mm, interesting. So they're getting fluids as they're laying down in this. Yeah. And they're being monitored via cardiovascular system. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's not something where you're just, you know, a patient just goes in there and sits on themselves unmonitored. I mean, we we have nurses specifically trained and designated to follow them. It's it's very much a procedure that is very safe, but at the same time requires a lot of um, supervision and for proper administration for to achieve proper effects. Wow, amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And how, what would you say for people who have advanced type of cancer, right? What have you seen in your clinic as far as how long until the markers go down? Um, and I know we're being generic, every case is different, but overall, would you say it takes a month or two as far as treatments to, to notice the change in, in the labs? Uh, if we're just talking about a change in how you feel, a change in labs, and you want to be really careful about, you know, I feel great. That doesn't equate one way or the other, but um, that, that can be immediate. That can be immediate. I've had patients that have come in and, you know, bone pain from cancer that has spread to bone. I think it's some of the worst pain that patients can experience. And yeah. I've had patients that have come in not able to walk because of the pain. And literally the next day, they have no pain. And that's because of the use of medical cannabis and other things. But so you can see effects immediate in how you feel. Labs, we can see those effects, you know, very quickly, one to two weeks. And again, the key is precision. The key is accuracy and what you're, what you're affecting with treatment. Uh, we've seen, you know, stage four pancreatic cancer, uh, stage four breast cancer, uh, you know, name it. We, we can see those cancers get better I don't want to say immediately, but within just a week or two, because we're targeting what's actually what the cancer is doing, how the cancer is behaving. And so we can target that specifically through that, again, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, and get the immune system doing its job. And, and so that's how we can see things that are, that'll be so quick in, in, you know, in benefit.
Yeah. And this is the key. What you're saying is precision medicine. There's never one treatment protocol for all. Uh, and I think this is really so important in what you do. It's revolutionary, I think, what you do um, because of the care that goes into individualized, precise medicine. Do you ever have patients that uh, had chemo and radiation, let's say, treatments, and then they come to you? Or would you say most of the patients that you have are the ones who are opting out of that and are coming in uh, to use a uh, more holistic uh, and integrative approach to treatment. Interesting. We see we see a balance of that. I mean, we'll have patients that come in and oh, I've never they've never taken a prescribed drug in their life, and and their bodies are very you know naive, if you will, to anything. And so you have to approach them very differently mm -hmm. than somebody that's been taking drugs all their life. I would say more than fifty percent of our the patients that come here to Brio Medical. They are patients that have gone through some degree of conventional, whether that be surgery, chemo, uh, radiation. And, and some of them will come in and say, I had no idea that this kind of approach existed. It's what I wanted, but I just didn't know it existed. And so for most of our patients, they're going to come in having had some degree of chemo, radiation, and surgery. Now that presents greater challenges because those force mutation. It's really interesting when you look at those three, somebody got a dog out there. Uh, there's um, those three therapies are foundational in conventional oncology, yet all three of those can cause the cancer to spread. So I always find it really interesting. Those therapies, if they spread cancer, what are we really doing? Because when you look at breast cancer, chemotherapy, full dose chemotherapy will shrink the primary tumor, but spread it. Yet when cancer spreads, that's 90% of morbidity and mortality associated with cancer. What are we doing? Now we may achieve a, a one year of no evidence of disease, yet if it recurs and it's spread to the bone, the lungs, the liver, what have we done? We've done something that now has changed the course, the trajectory of the patient's healing capacity. So we have to re-envision and rethink, I think, as the science is showing us to do differently. Now, in that, the good news is hyperthermia, photodynamic therapy, curcumin, vitamin C, CBD. So not even the psychoactive component. All of these can are just some examples of how you can actually chemosensitize. You can take a cancer that is become resistant and actually restore the sensitivity, just looking at it from a chemo perspective. And you can actually restore that sensitivity. So it, it shows that you can never just say, well, the, the job's done, that you've had chemo and this is resistant. We can always impact that cancer. Of course, we like to do it holistically, naturally, and integratively, but you can always do that. So even if a patient is opting for just doing conventional medicine, they can still seek therapies from a natural, holistic, and integrated perspective that are going to make what they do better. And, and reduce the side effects. Literally eating what you eat has been shown to reduce toxicity of full dose chemo by a thousand fold. So when docs say what you eat has no bearing on outcome, well, yeah, it may. It may have outcome on what that chemo does to your body, destroys it. So yeah, it's I can go on and on and on. But um, you know, we most of our patients that come in here are given no hope. They told they're told they can't be they can't be healed. Mm. and that they're dealing with resistance and that they're, there's no treatment options for them other than you know experimental studies. And they're like, I'm not going to be a lab rat. And there's always, there's always hope. And the site, you know, it's interesting. People go, well, how do doctors not know this? I said, I don't know. I guess they just don't read. Don't read or just blindly follow the protocols that are given without having the critical thinking of thinking outside the box. I think that's really the whole point of, the, of medicine is really to, to have <laughs> thought process that is not in the box, but out of the box. So it's wonderful that you're able to. We've got too much group thinking. We don't have enough critical thinking. Yes. <laughs> and how often do you recommend for patients who have gone through your treatments, treatment protocols to check in, or is it once a year, would you say, or what is the steps that so people will take after? Mm -hmm. we, patients come to us, they're here typically for six to eight weeks. And so when we're dealing with <clears throat> you know, advanced cancer that is spread like it, like it can, you know, we've got to, what I tell patients is what we're doing now is the sprint. 
it's to get ahead of this disease. Th that word literally just means the lack of wellness and, and get the body healing again. And then we have to transition into a longer healing phase. So it's that six to eight weeks sprint, and then we transition into a marathon. So when their patients are here with us, then they uh, go home and some of that, and it's variable. It's, again, I, you can't just put people in a protocol. Um, some patients go home and they don't need to come back. Some patients go home and then we do custom peptides based on you know uh, proteomics, transcriptomics, and genomics. And then they come back and cycle with peptides. And peptides are just short proteins. And so we cycle them with those and then they go home. And then they come back three months later for another cycle. As they transition, we have a patient here right now with breast cancer. She literally came in in a wheelchair with bone mets, and there was a major fracture there. And she's from New York, and I see her uh, this afternoon, and she's, I mean, her tumor markers are normal. They're normal, and they were in the hundreds for breast cancer. And now she's walking and in no pain. And, and she's just, I mean, she's living again. She's making plans again for life. And she's just, her and her husband are just sweethearts. But, um, you know, it's that, this is cancer. So I don't want to sit here and tell everybody that all stories are like that because cancer is a beast. It really is. Sometimes I'll go home and it, it's just like, oh, it, it's just a beast. And that's what drives me into the science because I want to help. I, I really want to help everybody as we can and then teach doctors to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, stories like that, Stories like another day, lady by the name of Beverly, her name was Cindy, by the way, uh, another patient, Beverly, who, who was told that after her recurrence, there was no healing hope. Um, and she's in Abilene enjoying her you know, grandkids. Those are the stories that, that help me to go to sleep at night, knowing that I'm, I'm following that bold mission. And, and those patients affect me and us as much as we affect them. And it's incredible. And what's great about those patients, they go tell everybody that there's hope. There is hope. And in cancer, I think that's the beginning of a patient's ability to heal is to have hope. And conventional medicine comes in and just rips it out. And it's like, where that's not a part of our job. We need to be honest and real with patients but a patient with a diagnosis of stage four cancer, take your name. They know they have a tough journey ahead of them. They don't need you to pile on. Give them real hope. Tell them, let's go heal. Let's see how far do you, your body will go. And let's just go after this as a team. And I think medicine has just lost a little bit of its way. And you know the, that's why I like the word origins, because I think they help us to better understand contextually what it is we're supposed to do. Mm. Nathan, thank you so much, first of all, for representing what it means to be in your divine mission, to be aligned fully with the reason you came here. And this is really to, to give hope to people that have no hope, for those physicians and practitioners that would like to, to have a deeper meaning and perhaps learn. Uh, you are such a great example, and it's so wonderful that you're doing what you're doing. Um, what is your website? How can people find you? Well, I have a personal website that's coming up very soon. I'll be actually launching a personal uh, podcast uh, really soon. So, um, I, you know, it's I love the medium of podcasting. Um, it's just I, I'm 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 a consumer of it, avid consumer of it. And I've done it before, but I'm gonna do it again. So currently um, I'm the medical director at Brio Medical. So if you go to briomedical.com, brio-medical.com, you'll find us there. But but look for my um personal website coming soon, um, as well as the podcast and and other exciting things to come soon. And the uh it's gonna be Dr. Nathan Goodyear is gonna be the um the website and podcast. So Wonderful. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for sharing your insights and giving hope to so many people around the world. Well, thank you for you getting there and spreading that hope because somebody can have hope, but if they can't get access or hear about it, okay, that is critical. And that's why that teaching component, which is what you're really doing, is so invaluable 
because we have to teach patients that there's hope. And we have to teach patients that they can heal. And so I think the teaching part of what we do is as important as the healing. So thank you for what you're doing. Again, love the title of your podcast. I think it's spot on. Thank you. Thank you so much. I bet.